So we're starting a new teaching series. We've finished with Romans. Lots of them are on the YouTube if you want to go back to that. Amazed by Jesus. I read a book last year by a guy called Simon Ponsonby called Amazed by Jesus. I found it just really encouraging, helpful. Buy it if you want to buy it and encourage you to do that. But we're taking some of the chapters. We're not teaching it directly, but we're just sort of using it as a bit of an outline, some of the thoughts. We want to focus on Jesus above all else this term. We want to really focus in on him. And it's a phrase uh, that crops up about 25 times in the Gospels. And here's just three of them for you, just to give you a flavour of what the people of the day thought when they encountered Jesus. Matthew 7, 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Matthew 8, 27. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Matthew 13, 54, coming to his hometown, he began teaching their people in, the, in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. I guess my conviction is that it, as we have a growing revelation of Jesus, an increasing understanding of who he is, what he's done in our lives, just how brilliant he is, then our faith will deepen and we'll grow as a church and in our own lives as well. And as people encounter Eagle's Nest, whether they stay for a short time or a long time, I guess my hope, not everybody will become followers of him, that's personal choice always, but may people encounter Jesus at least. May they have an experience where they come and realise that Jesus loves them, is committed to them, has a plan for their lives. But it's not just good enough to have our stories of 20 years ago about when Jesus profoundly impacted us. We want a growing understanding, a fresh revelation. We want, we want it to be like fresh news in our hearts, just how brilliant Jesus truly is. And so this term, that's the focus, to... to, to home in on him even further to see what the Lord might do in our midst. When he was a boy in the temple, people were amazed at his teaching. When Pilate passed judgment on him and washed his hands, he was amazed by Jesus. Whatever walk in life in, we're in, however much responsibility we carry, how much experience we've got, there is more of Jesus for us to be amazed at. That's my absolute conviction. In this season of your lives, are you open for a fresh understanding of who he is? A fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit? A fresh experience of what he might want to do in this next season? We used to sing a song years ago in church settings and we've had similar phrases this morning with some of them. But we used to sing, I believe he is here now standing in our midst. We have lots of chat. When we're choosing new songs to sing, the first one this morning was a new one and we've got some others later. We're always a bit of chat amongst us about what songs should we be singing as a church. Let's make sure we're singing enough songs about the cross. You know, that's really important. That we've got enough songs about the cross so we can focus on that and everything that spills out from that. Uh, hopefully we're not singing too many songs just about us. You know, how I feel today. Uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute. You know, the songs are, you make me feel better, Jesus. You know, that's why you exist. Of course it is. You know, you're the Lord of glory, but actually you exist to make me feel better in life. You know, it's like, it can be distorted sometimes in, in our worship if we sing too many songs where we're the object. The angels in heaven, of course, this is the sort of song they're singing to Jesus. And they sang a new song saying, singing to Jesus you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God uh, persons from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth then I look and I heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and glory and power forever and ever. 
Amen. The angels don't tend to sit around praising God, saying, you know, today's a good day because my bus turned up on time. Or I found a chocolate bar in my coat pocket I thought I'd forgotten about. Or thank God the kids went to bed early tonight. We've all prayed those prayers. We know it. But part of, you know, good on you, God, my good buddy. Don't you think I'm great? You know, that, that, that sort of worship can turn, if we're not careful, into a, a self-focused thing. But our conviction is that as we worship the greatness, the awesomeness, the might, the forgiveness, the salvation of Jesus, then we get a fresh revelation, like a fresh understanding of who he is and what he's done for us. Then that increases our devotion and our love for him so we want to exalt him magnify him but i'm also passionate about singing songs that remind us he's in the room now folks that's what blew my mind when i didn't know jesus and then came to an understanding of who he is that he wanted to encounter me that he wanted to reveal his love for me he wanted to grasp hold of my life, to fill it with purpose, purpose and destiny and meaning. I was blown away that Jesus knew my name. I was amazed that following Jesus is personal. And I guess we will continue. We always want to sing songs that remind us of that. This is personal, this connection. This encounter that God wants with each of us. It's one of the main messages of Jesus' life. Matthew 1, 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. Which means God with us. He's with us now. For where two or three are gathering my name. There I am with them final words of Jesus before the ascension therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I am with you always to the end of the age we have a tendency in our humanity I understand it because it's very much within me and it's within you as well to to build our faith on answers to prayers that we think God should be answering again we tend to revolve it a little bit around us years ago we had a neighbor who who was actually a church minister of a different church and tragically his wife left him and he used to tell me all the time how oh, she, she'll be back by Easter Sunday he, he believed you know he's that with his prayers and he believed that they, he was going to be back by Easter Sunday and he, he kept telling me this slightly manic look in his eyes but I understand why and Easter Sunday came and went and she didn't come home and his life tragically spiralled downhill after that. And you see, he, he built his faith on a possible answer to prayer, not the very person of Jesus himself. He's in the room now. Is it him you want to know? Is it him that you want to open your heart to? Is it him that you want to build your life upon? In our humanity, we tend to try and bargain with God. I'll serve you if this happens. I'll praise you if life works out this way. I'll believe in you if that happens for me. And we can be moved emotionally and encouraged greatly when folks share stories of, of being healed, praise God, getting a job, having an answer to prayer. But if we grasp the reality is, I don't think Josie's here this morning, is she? Is Josie here? I remember Josie telling me the different times that she, she's had cancer and one time in particular, that they couldn't find anything on the scan and she just knew something within her, the Holy Spirit we believe, was prompting her to go and get another check you know there, there was nothing there she'd been scanned she'd been checked and went again and they said no no oh we found something here that we'd have never found unless you had 
that, that sensation within you. And through great medical intervention and prayer, she was healed of cancer at that time. I think that might have been the third time she had it from memory. And so you say, praise God to that. You can't help but think, God, God's good, isn't he? So that encourages you, and rightly so. But I think my conviction this morning is that's still not quite the same as my heart hearing a whispering because I've chosen to open myself to him and have a personal relationship with him. There's something that's direct, something that changes me in a way that encouragement helps us always, but there must be something truly personal for ourselves. The psalmist helps us. We sang it this morning. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. It means to know God personally. Other verses talk about God's hand. They're the answers to prayer. That's where we receive blessing and power, uh, you know, and, and answers to prayer. His hand is the works that God does. But the order of stuff is quite important here. We seek his face to know him. And then, subsequent to that, we receive the blessings of his hand, the answers to prayer, the demonstrations of his power. My neighbour, you'd see, had built his emphasis and an answer to prayer, not the living God, Jesus Christ, who's in the room now, folks. We can know him. Just one more amazing story from Jesus this morning. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand up in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or destroy it? He looked around at them all and then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. The man with the withered hand in the culture of the day meant he probably was without work. It says it was his right hand, so it would have limited his ability greatly to find his way through life. We're talking about a tough culture to thousand years ago with people with deformities and similar the text doesn't say it but I bet he was hiding his hand somewhere he wouldn't have wanted his withered hand on show for all but then Jesus notices the man probably the guy everybody else is ignoring nobody wants to sit next to him he's not invited to many family meals he's an outcast but Jesus notices. Jesus knows us. He's in the room. He knows us. He knows our shame. And then Jesus said to him, the very thing he wouldn't have wanted, stand up. Come and stand here in front of everybody else. And then he told him to do the one thing he couldn't do. Stretch out your hand. You see, as we encounter Jesus, as we know him, as we begin to trust him more and more, we will hear his voice ask us to do things we cannot do. This is the walk of faith. This is the journey of life. We've got no wonder life feels overwhelming sometimes. How can we get through it if it is beyond us? Only by knowing Jesus for ourselves. Only by having this personal relationship with him. We can look at somebody else's life often and think, gosh, I don't know how you're doing it. And the truth is, it's Jesus sustaining them. And this is why Jesus blows my mind 30 years after getting saved. This broken, limited, shame-filled human being rejected by his community became the object of Jesus' focus, his gaze power and love and as we open our hearts to him that's true of us as well John Ortberg puts it this way 
he says Jesus was starting a new community. Jesus was wanting to begin a new kind of community where people who are needy and imperfect and in trouble and weak and deformed and ugly and shamed are particularly celebrated. Our brokenness gets us in the room and makes us part of this community if we'll accept it and accept Jesus. We're invited to the party. It's called community, walking together. You see, when I first got saved, a number of my friends were already good friends. And so I knew in the early days of my faith, I needed them to help me grow in my faith. Again, John Altberg would call it flourish, but it's growth. How am I going to develop? I need these people around my life. Still true today, but a few years roll on and you think, gosh, what can we do if we use this friendship for the sake of kingdom purpose of mission? So it becomes like a task-based thing. We can really crack on with this. You know, my heart is to see a town changed by people who love Jesus working together to make him known in the north part of Nottingham. But then for many years, I've come to a greater understanding. Both those things are true. We need one another to help us when times are difficult. Together, we can do far more than we realise and far more than we can on our own. So come on, let's make a difference for God. But what I came to realise more significantly that than that over the years is that what really matters in life so I can think back to some great work deals I did. Maybe you can think back to the best work presentation you've ever given. Maybe you can think back to the most successful management meeting you were ever part of, the best lesson you ever taught, uh, the best uh, piece you brought into... Well, I don't know how you value success. Those of you that are creative, the best song you've ever written or, or the best art piece you've ever done or the best bit of writing, you, you think back to the successes of your life and think back to the highest point. The truth is, the greatest moment of growth, the greatest accomplishment in any of our lives is when we make a difference in somebody else's life. This is why we're passionate about community. This is why we're passionate about having hubs as part of our church. That so we believe our greatest accomplishments come from the legacy we leave in the lives of other people that have been around with us. I'm glad you were in the room that evening because what you said stirred faith within me. I like hanging around with you because you seem to bring a level of hopefulness that changes my situation from just looking dark to being more positive. You seem to know your Bible so well that it encourages me that these are words of life that can change my life. There is something around community we don't get sitting in rows like this. We can have five minutes having coffee, wonderful, love it. But growth, significance comes as we receive and give to others around us. This term, all the hubs are going to look at the same thing, amazed by Jesus. If you signed up for a hub already, well done. I think they're going to start, most of them, not this week, but next week. So there's still a chance to sign up. I'll talk about that in a moment. If you've not signed up for one yet, even if you can't make it every week, let me encourage you because it's the way of, of building community. We, we were on holiday recently uh, in Switzerland, a friend of mine who I worked with 20 years ago. We, we worked together. So we see each other probably every two or three years, obviously not since COVID. But we formed something 20 years ago in the context of friendship that means that 20 years later, even though we've lived in different countries, he's willing to dri drive an hour to come and have a meal with us. It's good, isn't it? But I don't want my relationships to be stuck in 20 years ago. I'm building friendships now. I've got enough friendships in one sense. But my flourishing, my growth, comes from developing new relationships. I believe it with all of, with all of my heart. I could tell you about the time when I walked around Table Mountain on a work trip back in my, my business days, travelled quite a lot, always on my own, nearly always on my own, and then would land in a city, do a bit of work, and then go to the biggest land market, wherever it would be. So I didn't have time to read the guidebooks, but I knew Table Mountain was it in Cape Town. So I just got the taxi driver, dropped me off there, head up Table Mountain, walk around, you see the cloud that's like an envelope that falls off the sides. It's, it's an amazing place. You walk around the top for an hour, and, it, and it's wonderful. 
And the reality was it was an incredibly memorable experience. But something would have made it better. Friends or family with me. This is how life works. You can be on the most glorious mountain on the face of the planet, but something's missing because people close to you aren't with you. This is what I believe about life. So it's a new sort of community that Jesus is building. Let me read you the Ortberg quote once more. Jesus was wanting to begin a new kind of community where people who are needy and imperfect and in trouble and weak and deformed and ugly and shamed are particularly celebrated. May we be that sort of church. Let me invite the band back. So we'll go on a little bit of a journey together. We'll ask the Holy Spirit to give us a fresh revelation of Jesus as a church that may he come even more to focus we'll hear his name loads we'll sing his name loads we'll preach about him every week over this term and whether you've been doing this for a few weeks maybe never before or you've been serving him all of your lives I'm praying that you will have a personal fresh encounter of who he is let's stand shall we Jesus, my words will always fail in trying to convey your magnificence, in trying to establish in our hearts how truly wonderful you are, how committed you are to each of us. And God, I pray that through your spirit, our hearts will be open. Our hearts will be open to know you more deeply. In Jesus' name, amen.